Hi, Eric. Hey. Great to meet you. Great to meet you. So glad to have you here today. Excited to be here. A little nervous, but excited. Welcome to this interactive case interview training for me too. Top management consulting firm Bain has recently published a new mock case interview to help you prepare for your business case interviews. I think overall this Bain video is really well made, has a high production value and is instructive. What is lacking though and I like to add is an evaluation of the interview and explaining whether the candidate is doing really well or not and make you experience where and how you could do better. Yeah, how are you doing just more generally? I'm good, I'm good. Yeah, yeah. office is beautiful, everybody's wow. been great so far and just, yeah, excited to get going with the case. I'm Jack and spent five years as a consultant and project manager with McKinsey and Company and have extensive experience as a case interviewer myself. Have some scratch paper ready as I'm going to make this case interview tutorial as interactive as possible to make you learn. I'm so glad. Well, I'll be the one pushing us along. Don't worry if I finish this up, move us to another area. I'll be in charge in terms of the time management. Generally, this looks like a realistic setup for a personal case interview session. You sit in a random consulting firm office and hopefully face an amiable interviewer who takes responsibility for creating a friendly atmosphere. What is also really good is that the interviewer stresses that she is responsible for time management. In one of my own real job interviews, I once at some point asked the interviewer if we should now move on from the CV chit chat to the case interview part so that we would still have enough time left for the case. My unnecessary attempt to take over time management of the interview created a brief awkward moment. Don't do that. And be aware that in this Bain mock case interview, the personal CV interview part is skipped and we jump straight into the case. Mind you as well that normally you would still be expected to appear in full office attire to your interview, hence rather with a suit than just the jeans. Also, this setup may resemble a later interview round, since as you know, many first round interviews nowadays take place online. Good to know, thank you. Great, so should we jump in? Yeah, let's do it. All right, so let me give you a little bit of the context of the case. So our client is Foodco. They're a multi-billion dollar client that has leading brands across many different food categories. Yeah. Right now they've narrowed in on the alternative milk category. They believe it's growing quickly, has some attractive elements to it. And alternative milk you can define as anything that's non-dairy plant-based. So okay. things like almond, oat, coconut, soy, you name it, all goes within alternative milk. I think I used almond in my latte this morning. So. There you go, oh, so you're, you're yeah, familiar. I'm yeah. ready. Already. Such mild jokes that loosen up the atmosphere are always fine and welcome. By the way, I have cut out some of the fluff talk parts from the original interview to make this tutorial video as crisp as possible and not to be accused of piracy in this reaction video. Feel free to watch the entire Bane video on the Bane YouTube channel. I'll link it in the video description and up here. Now let us complete the case briefing to launch your training. They've partnered with Bain to determine how they want to enter and whether or not they think this asset okay. is the right way to enter the space. Okay. Because they're pretty familiar with this yeah. market, they've narrowed in on a target named Smilk. Okay. And Smilk, in terms of its profile, is a pretty attractive profile. That's why they're interested in it. Okay. To give you some facts on it, it has, over the past three years, been doubling its profit each year. Oh, wow. That's so impressive. Very, very yeah. strong performance overall. It has about 6% share of the alternative milk market okay. and um, is expected to grow to 8%. Okay, so moderate, modest growth. Right. Now, this Smilk has been able to expand across Europe and the U.S., but Foodco for this particular piece of work is only interested in the U.S. market. Okay, good to know. So we'll be focusing on that. Now, here's the real complicating element of it. They expect that Smilk should be able to increase its profit by 6x over the next five years. Okay. So as we think about this overall, I'd love to have you tell me a little bit about how you would approach assessing this question. And in particular, we need to understand whether or not this 6x profitability growth is feasible. Okay. I'd like to pause the video briefly here and ask you, how would you proceed after receiving this initial case briefing? What should be just the very next step? I spoil for you that I think the interviewee does not do well in this following part. Pause the video now in case you want to think for yourself. I resume with my recommendation.
What I think is really bad is that the interviewer did not take any notes while the interviewer shared her case briefing. Furthermore, immediately after the case briefing, you should always repeat and summarize the information given to you and clarify the objective. These were the statements shared that you ideally should have kept track of. Our client is Foodco, a large food conglomerate. Foodco wants to enter the alternative milk market and is considering to acquire the startup company Smilk. Smilk has doubled its profit over each of the last three years and is active in the US and Europe. And Smilk has a 6% market share in the US alternative milk market. Its market share is expected to grow to 8% within five years. And coming to the case objective, our project scope or case scope is just the US market. Um, then the key question is, do we endorse the Smilk management's forecast that it can grow its US profit by the factor 6 within the next five years? And how do you suggest to approach this analysis? When you repeat and clarify the case briefing that the interviewer has given to you, you demonstrate you are an active listener and you minimize the probability of misunderstandings. Once you have done that, you can then proceed in the way the interviewee in the Bain mock case interview does. Great. I think I understand the situation. Can I ask a couple clarifying questions? Sure, absolutely. Awesome. I imagine they have different business units like almond, soy, oat, any, any gaps in their portfolio that I should be aware of? Not that it's relevant to the case okay, currently. Gotcha. And then finally, just in terms of understanding, does Buco have any other specific acquisition thesis that I should be aware of, any metrics that they want to hit, or is just broad assessment, get our opinion, whether it's good or not? You know, that's a good question. So mostly they're focused on whether or not they can achieve the profit. Okay. But what's equally important is thinking about share and okay. the trade-offs between the two of those. Okay. It is a good habit to ask clarifying questions at the beginning of a case. Here it yielded an additional pointer on the case objectives. Namely, we can now add, consider the trade-off between the 6x profit objective and market share. Awesome. Well, I think I understand the problem. Excited to get into it. You might have to take a couple moments Please to structure do. my thoughts. It is common practice for candidates to take out a few minutes to structure their planned approach to a case before diving into it. I invite you to take a sheet of paper and to sketch out how you would approach and structure this case. Pause the video now. Before I share my advice, let us see what the Bain interviewee does. Awesome. So as I think through this problem of how to assess uh, Smilk from Food Coast perspective mm -hmm. and think through whether the profitability target is achievable. Yeah. There's really three buckets that I want to look into. First is the alt uh, milk market itself. Great. Second is a deep dive into Smilk and their internal operations. Perfect. And then finally, I have some other considerations and risks that I want to look at. In the following, Eric, the interviewee, is expanding on his framework, but I skip that part as I don't find it very insightful. I'm afraid I think Eric's framework is extremely basic and if you had taken out a couple of minutes out to develop it, you would not meet the expectations of the interviewer. In my books, this simplistic framework would almost certainly yield you minus points and you would even be at risk of failing your interview based on the feedback that the structure of your case approach had been too poorly defined. As a minor point, in this sketch the client company would be Foodco, but we actually want to understand more about the target company Smilk. Let me demonstrate to you what I believe would be a more sophisticated case approach and compare with what you have taken down. Indeed, I would also first want to evaluate the attractiveness of the US alternative milk market. For the market analysis, I would at least want to cover market size and market growth. Since the interviewer mentioned that market share analysis will be important, I suggest to explicitly look into competition with the number of competitors, their market shares, their strategies and pricing. Also, it most likely is a very young market, so what are its barriers to entry? Of course, you could consider the barriers to entry also under the market analysis bucket. I would want to know more about the preferences and segments of alternative milk customers, as well as what it takes to make traditional milk customers switch to alternative milk products. For the products, let us find out what product types are out there, what margins can be expected and how they could be substituted. Well, of course, they are substituted themselves already. 
Then let us turn to the potential target for the acquisition. What actually is the projected price for the acquisition? Then, very importantly, to evaluate the possibility to achieve the Profit 6x target, we need to analyze the financial situation and profitability of Smilk. Close to that are Smilk's pricing and cost structures. What strategy does Smilk currently follow? Finally, we want to cover Smilk's staff qualifications, it is a startup after all, its customers, products and suppliers. When Eric expands on what he wants to cover under risks, he actually talks about the capabilities of Foodco. While these might not be the focus of this case, you could at least mention that you want to check for our clients' experience with acquisitions and their integration and financing of a deal. Given it is a multi-billion dollar company, you probably get green light here, but you will get some brownie points for considering these factors. Consider expected synergies from the deal, for instance by allowing Smilk to use Foodco's existing supplier and distribution network, and bring up a cultural fit topic. Lastly, even though you are tasked to specifically evaluate the Smilk acquisition, you can make the point that alternative options for market entry exist. Eric also mentioned these three main buckets, even though he named them differently. However, his framework lacked detail. For instance, he did not even mention the competitor analyses. Your case approach may look somewhat different, but if you plan to cover most of these topics, you are on the safe side. I like to make you aware that I share a brief 3 minute tip on how you can present your case framework most effectively in an online case interview setup in order to stand out as a candidate in this video here. And if you like this video tutorial this far, please give it a thumbs up and I invite you to subscribe to my Yoon Consulting YouTube channel for further top quality advice on your business and consulting careers. Once you have presented your proposed approach to the case, you can bring it back to the interviewer and check if she's fine with your preferred starting point or would like you to start elsewhere. So let's start where you suggested. Okay. And I have a slide here that gives you a picture of the market. Okay. And I would love for you to tell me, what does this tell you about the dynamics of the milk market? Okay. If I could just take a couple moments to orient myself. So what I'm seeing is a chart of Kind of the U.S. milk sales over the past 10 years forecasted uh, into the future for five years from now. The interviewer has put out her first chart. I invite you to take a moment to think which conclusions you would draw from this chart. For this, pause the video now. Let me resume. I paid my first piece of attention to the projected CAGA of the alternative milk market or the compound annual growth rate, which projects that for the next five years the alternative milk market will grow by 13% per annum. My business judgment tells me that if milk grew its sales just with this market growth rate, it would not be enough for Smilk to increase its profit by the factor 6 within 5 years, which is equal to increasing profit by 500% from now. If I have triggered your geek mechanisms now, if Smilk's profit growth was only driven by revenue growth, Smilk would have to increase its sales by a CAGR of 43% per annum to increase its sales and profits by the factor of 6 within 5 years. Anyway, this calculation you cannot complete without a calculator and while I like to activate your brain, this calculation is not necessary for solving this case. Eric does a very good job in synthesizing the key information from this chart. And the first thing that immediately jumps out to me is you can see that the overall market has been in decline mm -hmm. and forecasted going forward, it's at best going to remain roughly flat. That's right. So from the overall perspective, not great. But what is exciting for Smilk is when you do a deep dive into the alternative milk segment, mm -hmm. that is actually expected to grow and, and quite considerably over the next five years, a, a low double digit CAGR is actually pretty exciting to me. And so feeling good about that and looking closer at the data row, I'm seeing some numbers that we can manipulate in order to get a sense of exactly what the size of the alt milk market is today and then what it's going to grow to five years from now, which I think will be a good starting point to help us understand the feasibility of the 6x target. Agree. Let's go ahead okay. and do that. Okay. So uh, in order to combine these variables, I'm thinking we first take the alt milk share mm -hmm. uh, today multiply that by the overall market size, which will give us the alt milk market uh, in dollars today and five years from now. Putting some numbers, 19 billion. Is it okay if I round that? Yes, okay. please do. 19 billion times 11%. That is roughly 
roughly two billion, mm -hmm. two point one billion. So that is today. And then in five years, we are going to uh, 19.2 billion times 20%, which is 3.8 billion. But I'm gonna go ahead and round that to Great. 4 billion. So like I said, um, we now have a better sense of what might be achievable mm -hmm. if Smilk just kind of maintains market share, maintains status quo going forward. It's exciting, it's 2X, um, but it is a far cry from their 6X okay. target. According to my judgment, the interviewee did well in extracting the key insights from this chart and these are the conclusions you also ought to have reached yourself. The market size is going to double within 5 years, but that falls well short of the desired factor of 6x for SMIC's profit increase. One piece of advice, I think the candidate made his life slightly harder than needed. He could have just immediately rounded to 2 billion US dollar market size today versus 4 billion US dollar market size tomorrow. Nobody anyway knows the exact market size in 5 years and often you only need to be super precise if the interviewer asks you so. However, there is one way the interviewee in this case could go from good to great and I wonder if you found that too. An excellent interviewee always tries to connect the dots to the information he or she has already been given before and I also love it when candidates do this in my own case interview sessions. An outstanding candidate would here remember the case briefing, specifically statement number 4. Smilk has a 6% market share in the US alternative milk market. Its market share is expected to grow to 8% within 5 years. We can combine this with the information from a previous chart to calculate SMIC's current and expected future revenue with a current market size of 2 billion US dollar and a 6% market share of SMIC, we can derive that SMIC's current revenue amounts to 120 million US dollar in the US. In 5 years, SMIC's market share is projected to be 8% of 4 billion US dollar or 320 million US dollar. Combining the effects from both market growth and market share growth, Smilk would grow its sales and profits by the factor 2.7. So, with the information already given to you in this case, you could already make the statement that Smilk should not just at least double its business, but almost triple it. Can you see how this early conclusion would make you stand out as a candidate? If you like this video, please smash the like button and share it with a peer of yours who is also preparing for their business case interviews. I also invite you to check out the resources available for your preparation on my UN Consulting channel. And if you like to keep in touch, I invite you to sign up to my UN Consulting newsletter. All the links in the description below this video. Let's move on. However, I'm more bearish about the achievability of the 6x profit target. In order to get a better sense of that achievability, I would love to look at any internal financials that we have from Smilk to see how they've grown over the past. I'm so glad that you asked and, and had us go there because I'd love to think a little bit about the feasibility of okay. this share gain. Now that okay. we've isolated that they will need to gain share to reach their targets potentially okay. or other levers, I'd love you to tell me a little bit about what this competitor market view tells you about their ability to gain share. Okay. Just orienting myself quickly. So what I'm seeing like right off the bat is not too long ago, only a year and a half, mm -hmm. um, there weren't that many players and Smilk was still very nascent. What are your takeaways from this chart? If you like, pause the video for a moment and think for yourself. Let us resume to watch Eric's solution. But over time, Smilk has moderately grown its market share. Seems like they've plateaued yeah. uh, very recently, and they are the smallest player in an ever increasing competitive and crowded market. Correct. And then, just interpreting uh, the names here, Large Snack Co. looks like the market leader, which could potentially be not great for Smilk mm -hmm. if they're going up against somebody that is very well financed uh, and, right. and very entrenched in the market. And so. Uh, 
from looking at this, I'm feeling even better about the view that the 6x uh, profit might not be achievable simply because I don't see an easy win here in order to gain share. Mm -hmm. However, I'm not going to give up. Um, I think some things that could help them achieve that, if any of these competitors are potentially acquisition targets mm -hmm. and Food Co. could do a quasi-like roll-up strategy. That's a great. That could be a way. The interviewee's points are all valid and strong. I would have chipped in five more observations. Firstly, overall this still is a fragmented market with no clear leadership. That is good news for Smilk. Secondly though, Large Snack, Alt Milk 3 and Alt Milk 5 have all entered the market after Smilk and have already gained more market share than Smilk has. That does not make Smilk look good. Thirdly, Smilk's market share has remained constant for almost one and a half years. That does not make me confident that it can climb up from 6 to 8% market share as promised. Fourthly, including Smilk, there have been 5 new market entrants to the US alternative milk market in the last 18 months. That suggests that barriers to market entry are low and Smilk may have to face new competitors in the next 5 years. Fifthly, at the beginning of the case it was said that Smilk had doubled its profit during each of the last 3 years. When you see this graph, it makes me believe that most of that aggressive profit growth has been achieved outside of the US, perhaps in Europe. You see, you can still squeeze out more information from this single chart. It does not really offer though many more insights on the feasibility of the Profit 6x goal. I again skip some chit chat between the interviewer and the interviewee and move us straight to the heart of the case. However, I'm increasingly bearish on the ability to hit that 6x uh, rep or profitability increase over the next five years. In order to feel more comfortable about that part, I would love to look internally to Smilk in terms of their financials to understand how they've grown and like you just suggested, are there any opportunities that they could uh, kind of untap potential to steal share? That's great. I think we're going to explore both the internal okay. and the external awesome. that you mentioned. So first, let's go to the internal. I have some data on the company. Okay. Could you first orient me to what you see in terms of the data you do have and what you would need in order to answer this 6x profit question? Okay. So what I'm seeing, like you said, we have financial data for Smilk broken out uh, from their US business and their European business. And looks like it's a little bit of a puzzle to solve in terms <laughs> of uh, so, some blanks that we need to fill in. Love and, some logic games. Yeah, love, love some logic <laughs> games. And so what I'm seeing in terms of how to, well, just to react like very quickly to this. It's practice time for you again. And I'd like to invite you to ponder over two questions. First. What are your initial takeaways from seeing these numbers? Second, how can you fill in the missing numbers in this matrix? Pause the video now. Let us resume to watch Eric's solution. It's interesting that the US business is only uh, a quarter of overall profitability mm -hmm. compared to the European business, which is great observation, which is important because we're only focused on the US and from mm -hmm. uh, Food Coast perspective. The second thing that sticks out to me is there's quite a a delta in terms of the margin between mm -hmm. the two geographies and so you know to keep this on our radar moving forward we'd love to understand why that delta exists and if there's any way that we could potentially bring the u.s business up to up to snuff with what they're seeing in europe but to get to your question in terms of how to fill this chart out what i'm seeing is we have revenue today mm -hmm. and we have the margin so we can back solve for this profit figure right here and then we know in the US what the market size is today. Right. We know what their share is, so that'll give us this value. And then mm -hmm. same approach, knowing the margin, we can back calculate what profit is, that'll leave this hole, and then mm -hmm. we can kind of fill in from there. I just want to stress here how I love how the interviewee does not straight jump into the computations, but first tells the interviewer the structure of how he is going to compute the missing figures. Let us watch how Eric proceeds. Now, before we do that, going through that process, what is it going to tell you about whether or not they can achieve that 6x profitability? So what it's going to tell me is it's going to tell me what profit is today. Mm -hmm. And then we know what profit is today. 
we know what the market is expected to be five years from now, mm -hmm. what their market share is expected. So that'll give us revenue. Right. Then if we multiply by a margin, that'll give us what, if everything goes as we're forecasting, no changes in margin, what profitability would be. Right. Just looking at these numbers, if we do that, like we said from before, with no material change in share, they're only expected to gain two points. Right. That's not gonna close the gap unless we see some sort of margin increase like that's also not going to close the gap. Mm -hmm. But I do think that there are still ways that we could achieve this. One would be if we could increase the profitability of the U.S. segment to get to Europe. That'll get us some of the way. My intuition is not going to get us all the way, mm -hmm. but there also could be some margin improvement that you would see from Synergies rolling into Food Co. I would expect that distribution, logistics, et cetera, would get cheaper. Right. Also, purchasing power of a really large company mm -hmm. could help get the cost of goods down for these different types of milks, materials, plastics, et cetera. Um, and so I'm kind of imagining a sensitivity table to where if we, like if we know what the market would need to, would look like in the future there's some implied share that they would have to get to assuming profitability remains right. the same and then vice versa if we assume no share gain but uh, calculate what profitability the margin would need to increase to hit the target that'll help us understand the extremes of the sensitivity table and then help us get a better sense of could reality exist somewhere in the middle great I think Eric makes great points here and he shares a great idea. With his sensitivity analysis, he suggests to look into the trade-off between market share gain and profitability, which was, we remember, the fourth case objective. First, get ready for the calculations in the matrix. Why don't we go ahead and do the exercise you suggested so that we can really get our arms around what the real potential might be to okay. increase profit. Is it okay if I just write on? Yes, okay. please do. So um, revenue is 320 million, profit margin is 15%. So to arrive at this profit figure, just just 320 million times 15% mm -hmm. and that will give us the dollar value. Great. So 10% of 320 is 32, half of that is 16, which means that this is 48 million. Great. Um, what I said earlier for the US business, we know that the market is 2 billion today and they have 6% share. Mm -hmm. So that is 120 million, which means 320 minus 120 is 200 million. We know that if this is 10%, 10% um, of 120 is 12, mm -hmm. and then 18% of 200 is 36 million, which checks because 12 plus 36 is 48. I like to add that Eric did greatly in remembering the current market size and milk market share so that he could use the current milk revenue as a starting point. Very often, the interviewer will provide you with a new chart and expect that you will remember and combine it with the information given to you before. However, in this case, you can actually derive all missing numbers solely from the data given on this chart. I roll back slightly. Once you have calculated the overall company profit, you can actually apply the two regional profit shares to determine the regional profits. Then you can apply the profit margins reversely to obtain the revenues by region. Now, let us see how the interviewee performs his suggested sensitivity analysis. So now that we have all of this mapped out, we can put some specific numbers to what their actual profit target is. Great. And so if they are at 12 million today and they need to 6x, that means they need to get to 72 million. Mm -hmm. And so, like I was saying, in terms of understanding how they might get there, we know that there's going to be some latent growth, assuming they hit their market share targets and the market grows like we expected. Right. So I can figure out what that contribution would be. And then the delta would essentially come from the sensitivity table that I outlined. Does that sound like a plan? Great. Okay. Let's go ahead and do it. So um, we know that, go ahead and transfer over here, market five years from now is going to be 4 billion and they're going to have 8% share, which translates to $320 million in, in revenue. And then, so just from that, if they keep the 
profitability margin, that means that they are getting to 32 million. So that's good, like we, we've already talked about, but it is still Far cry. $40 million <laughs> short. We, we need to more than double this. And so that, let's go find how we might do that. And so from the revenue slash market share perspective, uh, and then looking at it from the profitability perspective. So when I look at how much they would need to achieve, we'll, we'll solve backwards here. So we know that they need 72 million. If we are going to assume the 10% profitability, mm -hmm. that's simple math. We know that they need to grow um, to $720 million of revenue. Right, at that profit level. At that profit level. That seems like quite a bit. Mm -hmm. um, if we go ahead and figure out what that implied market share would be uh, very quickly. So we know it's a 40, 72, so that would be one, uh, four, three, two, 18, 18 percent market share. Mm -hmm. Here, the video may not be absolutely clear. So what Eric does is assuming that Smilk will achieve the 6x or 72 million US dollar profit goal purely by increasing revenue. Assuming the 10% profit margin in the US, this implies that Smilk would need to grow its US revenue by 6x to 720 million US dollar. He then compares the 720 million US dollar hypothetical future revenue to the forecasted market size of 4 billion US dollar and derives the required 18% market share. Which is triple from what they are at today. Um, which is a lot to gain, especially since they plateaued out right. over time. So again, I think we're going to need to dip into this profitability perspective. Yes. And so what I'm thinking about here is we'll assume that they maintain share uh, that we're forecasting of 8%. So we know that they'll be starting with $320 million of top line. Mm -hmm. As a reminder, this is projected future Smilk revenue in five years based on combined market and market share baseline growth. Again, we're trying to solve for this 72 million. And so now it is just figuring out what the margin is. And if I do this, it looks like it is just higher than 20% but to put some math to it, three, two, two, 64, and that leaves us eight. So it's like 22 to 23%. Great. The result is correct, but I'm not sure you need to engage in long division for this. If you are fit in mental fractional arithmetics and percentage calculation, you may see that you can reduce the 72 over 320 by 8. So this is equal to 9 over 40 and this is equal to 22.5%. If you feel you ought to brush up your percentage calculation skills, I have covered you in this 5 minute video in which I refresh your mind on the foundations of percentage calculation and share a few cool mental math tricks. So. 23%. Again, that's big, but if we look at the European business as potentially mm -hmm. where we might get to, so upper bounds, 18%, call it 20. Maybe mm -hmm. if we get some synergies from Food Co., I think we need to do some further analysis to see if we can unlock, fully unlock this 23%. Right. But I'm now getting a little less bearish than I was originally. So I'm going to update my hypothesis that this is a good asset. I like the market that they're in. Um, I like the growth potential from the profitability perspective, the, the lever that exists particularly here in terms of matching the European business. Um, and I think a combination of these two could make the 6X profit uh, target achievable. We might not get all the way there, but I mm -hmm. think we might get pretty close, which I think would be exciting to Foucault. Right. In his conclusions, the candidate is really strong. To summarize his arguments, he says that it may be possible for Smilk's US business to catch up with its Europe business profit margin of 18%. From there, Smilk's US profit margin would only need to climb up by another 5 percentage points to reach the required profit margin of 22.5%, which would indeed allow Smilk to reach its 6x US profit target, and maybe this is possible through future synergies with our client company, Foodco.
The candidate has produced these great insights from his sensitivity analyses. You would think this would be a nice point in time to finish the case, but the interviewer pulls one more charge from up his sleeve. Could still make it attractive, and yeah. and I like your sensitivity because you know you don't need it to be on either end of these yeah, extremes. Exactly. But we are asking for a lot to go right: share gain exactly. and margin. Exactly. So why don't we take a look at some of the external factors that you had mentioned? Okay. Um, so I'd love you to take a look at this and tell me what it it tells you about the competitive market. Okay. So there's a lot of information here. If I could just orient myself quickly. So what I'm seeing is smoke compared to. Um, looks like a lot of the major players from this early market share right. map that we looked at earlier. What are your key takeaways from this, I promised, last chart of this case? If you like, pause the video for a moment to think for yourself now. I resume with my observations, please compare with yours. The first two lines do not contain much new information, they just relate to the info on this earlier chart. What is striking is that Smilk presents one of the only two brands with a high customer satisfaction rating, but currently suffers from a low brand awareness. This leads me to the hypothesis that there is further potential to grow if a new potential owner, Foodco, leverages its resources for strong marketing campaigns. Furthermore, a high price does not seem to be an impediment to growth. The two companies with the highest product prices are those that have managed to gain the largest market shares. Given that Smilk's pricing is lower than that of Old Milk 3 and Large Snack, this makes me confident that there might be further potential to increase price and profitability, especially since Smilk is considered a premium brand. Let us hear what Eric observes. What I'm seeing is first validating that, you know, mm -hmm. Smilk is at where they are today. They're a smaller player in the market. And then, you know, Alt Milk 5 and Large Snack Co. are kind of the behemoths. Right. Which it's exciting that in the last 18 months they've been able to do this. Again, I think points to the attractiveness of this market, but also paints a, a potentially negative light from the competitive landscape. I love seeing for Smilk some of the word associations here. Yeah. Uh, fun, delicious, premium. Like that sounds like a really good brand right. that could be you know, kind of the core tenants and assets that we could leverage for, for future growth. Mm -hmm. Again, this high customer satisfaction, I think is only solidifying that. This might be bad right now, the fact that customer awareness is low, but if we're starting from a low base, I think there's opportunity that we could use to increase mm -hmm. um, that going forward, which would help us increase sales, help us improve the market share that we have. And then the pricing difference is quite interesting as well. It looks like we're roughly kind of middle of the road, whereas, you know, there might be some upward potential from pricing right. that we see. Right. Um, you know, Alt Milk has gained a ton of share. Yes, people do view it as overpriced, but, um, you know, there might, maybe we don't go all the way to $6, but I think there might be some room, especially because we're seen as premium and that's not a word association I see here. So maybe the willingness to pay right. for a premium product should be there. If you compare Eric's observations with mine, you may agree that his insights are more descriptive while I have tried to carve out more actionable conclusions from these data. Arguably, it is more difficult to interpret the chart on the spot, but Eric could have asked for another timeout of a minute or so to screen the chart before commenting on it. I again skip two minutes of the original video and warp us straight to the case wrap up. Feel free to think through how you would summarize the case and your findings and pause the video now. We watch how Eric concludes the case. Well, this has been fantastic. I'd love to take a step back and, okay. and just ask you at this point, knowing we don't have all the information that we typically would have, okay. where, where is your recommendation and your hypothesis at this point? My recommendation to Foodco is that they acquire Smilk uh, mm -hmm. for the following reasons. One, I think the alternative milk market segment is exciting, expected to double over the next five years. And second, I think Smilk in terms of the assets that it is bringing is a great platform to be able to grow and get close to the 6X profitability target. Customers love it. It's seen as a premium brand and there's a lot of potential that we could tap into there, especially if we consider synergies that Foodco will bring. However, 
This recommendation is not without risk. Uh, like I alluded to, the 6x profitability target is quite ambitious. We've run the numbers and there's going to need to be both market sh um, share gain as well as improving profitability in order to hit that target. But understanding we might not get all the way there, I would love to, for next steps, start looking into different pricing strategies that we could employ uh, in order to prove revenue, improve market share moving forward. And then and there's always the uh, ability to negotiate with Smilk on the acquisition price, understanding that their expectations might not be grounded fully in reality. I think this is a really strong summary of a case and it also suggests some next steps. Sometimes you are asked for some creative brainstorming on a certain topic at the end of a case, but this was not required here. Let us see how the interviewer reacts. That's fantastic. I'm, I, your rationale makes so much sense and I'm so glad that you've highlighted some of the key considerations and risk, but you, you absolutely targeted the right next steps here for this project. Awesome. So very nicely done and it was wonderful to meet you. Yeah, thank you for working through the case with me. Take care. I must admit at this point I had to smile a bit. Few interviewers would be so joyous and full of praise even if you have performed extremely well and would rather keep a poker face until they have consulted with their interviewer colleagues. This end of the interview has been very friendly, maybe an example of a famous Bainy spirit. Let me share with you my personal evaluation of the interviewee performance and the feedback I would give to the candidate after this case interview. I think the candidate derived the main conclusions expected for this case and always kept the case objectives in mind. The case was not particularly quant heavy, but the interviewee showed solid quant skills. He also took the risk to suggest the sensitivity analysis, which required him to run more computations than the interviewer may have expected. Throughout the interview, the interviewee showed confidence and great communication skills. However, in my view, the start of the case was not amazing. The interviewee missed the opportunity to repeat the case briefing and in my view almost bombed it with his underwhelming framework for structuring his approach to the case. Be aware that sometimes a candidate does not pass an interview due to a poorly structured case. He could have stood out more as a candidate if he had connected the dots earlier in the case and a summary of the last chart I found a little less on point compared to his previous analyses. Overall, I would rate the interviewee performance as a 7.5 out of 10. The candidate strongly recovered from a shaky start. If you found a merciless interviewer though, he or she could potentially reject you on the basis of a privileged case framework. What is your view on this Bain case interview and the interviewee performance? Let me know in the comments below. Furthermore, almost simultaneously Bain published another mock case interview on its channel where the same interviewer is staring but in an online interview conducted with another interviewee. I was first disappointed when I realized that the same Smilk case was used, but then I actually found it very instructive to compare the ideas and performances of the two interviewees. I thought the other interviewee was sharper in the early case parts, but lacked accuracy at the end of it and came to totally different conclusions. I link that second Bain mock case video in the video description too. If you are preparing for your consulting case interviews, you may want to check out this video here and of course my dedicated playlist too. I hope you found this video helpful. See you soon, Jack.